Last week, if you remember, we gave a series of introductions to the opening dua, to saying A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Ar-Rajeem and then to Surah Al-Fatiha, which we've agreed is the greatest surah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, seeing that you will recite Al-Fatiha in every rak'ah of your salah, from the fard and from the sunnah, whether it's qiyam, whether it's your, uh, your specific qiyam of taraweeh, your istikhara, your wudu, sunnah, whatever salah you do, your salah will almost always feature Surah Al-Fatiha if you are praying by yourself or if you are leading a congregation. So it's key, it makes sense to understand Surah Al-Fatiha. And this series wouldn't be anywhere near wholesome or complete if we didn't start a light journey through the verses of Surah Al-Fatiha to understand what we are reciting around 27 or so times a day. Who is Rabbul Alameen? Who is Maliki Yawmiddin? Why is it arranged in that way? Who is Ar-Rabb, Rabbul Alameen? What is Al-Alameen? Who, who are Al-Maghdubi Alayhim and Al-Dalleen? What is Siratullah Al-Mustaqeem? What are these things? How can you enjoy your Salah uh, to the full potential if you don't understand something you are reciting so many times a day? So we're going to dedicate the rest of this session, inshallah ta'ala, and maybe most, if not all of next week, inshallah, speaking just about Surah Al-Fatiha to understand it. And I've heard this from numerous students of knowledge and mashayikh, especially those who are interested in the field of tafsir. They will almost always say, of all the surahs of the Quran that we have studied and taught, none was more enjoyable. None was more accomplishing and fulfilling than understanding and teaching the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. I remember around maybe 15 years ago teaching the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. We did this in about maybe eight or ten weeks. This was in Bristol and Quran Academy. This is not the intention here. We want to just to cover the verses in a light way to understand and to unlock some of the gems of the surah. And just as importantly to access khushu'a, which we said one of the levels of it is understanding is understanding. So you begin your Surah Al-Fatiha by saying Bismillah rahman rahim which you translate as in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. You say Bismillah, which means in the name of Allah. In the Arabic, Bismillah means Abda'u Bismillah. I start with the name of Allah. That's what Bismillah literally means. I begin with the name of Allah. Begin what? Begin every one of your doings, major, important, or mundane. You begin them all with the name of Allah. You say Bismillah. So you begin your recitation of the Quran, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And you begin your consumption of food by saying Bismillah in the name of Allah. And before drinking, you do that, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. When embarking on travel, you do that, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. When closing your door at night, when covering your vessels of food, uh, when mounting your vehicle, when beginning your wudu, even when it comes to starting or enjoying marital relations with your spouse in the pure and halal, this is Bismillah with the, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the context of Surah Al-Fatiha, when you say Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, it means I begin. Begin what? I begin the recitation of the Quran with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah. Al-Bukhari narrates on the authority of Jabir that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, أغلق بابك واذكر اسم الله Close your door, i.e. before you go to sleep. Close your door and remember the name of Allah. وأطفئ مصباحك واذكر اسم الله and Turn off your lamp and remember the name of Allah. وأوكي سقاءك واذكر اسم الله and Tie your water skin and remember the name of Allah. وخمر إناءك وَذْكُرِ اسْمَ الله And cover your vessel and remember the name of Allah. So when closing your door, say Bismillah. 
and we're turning off your light now using your switch because you're not using a lamp anymore, a lantern. Say Bismillah. And when you tie your water skins, now of course we don't use bags or to, of, of leather to drink water, we use cups. After you finish drinking, or you are covering the lid of something you're drinking from, say Bismillah. And he said, cover your vessels and remember the name of Allah. If you have food that is uncovered, cover it. Even if it is with a stick, as the hadith says. Because there is a day in the year when an afa, a disease, comes down from the heavens and it affects every bit of food that remains overnight uncovered. So he said, cover your food and say, Bismillah, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah. And this is an old statement, an ancient statement. It's as old as the hills. Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, the first Rasul, messenger, sent to humanity. Not the first prophet. He said to his people, وَقَالَ ارْكَبُوا فِيهَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ مَجْرِيهَا وَمُرْسَاهَا He said to his people, mount the ark. In the name of Allah is its sailing, and in the name of Allah, Bismillah, is its anchorage. Come onto the mount, come onto the ark, he said, mount it, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And its anchorage will be in the name of Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu. Bismillah. I start with the name of Allah. In the context of Al-Fatiha, it means I begin my recitation of the Quran with the name of Allah. Allah. And notice how your recitation is introduced with the name Allah. Not Bismil Rahman or Bismil Aziz subhanahu wa ta'ala or Bismil Jabbar or Bismil Kareem in the name of Al Jabbar, in the name of Al Aziz, in the name of Al Rahman. No, you say in the name of Allah. And the name Allah undoubtedly is the greatest sound and the greatest name and the greatest meaning that has ever resonated within the ear of man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Almighty, He said, هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ Do you know of anyone who has taken this name other than Allah? One of the two translations of the ayah. Many have claimed divinity, many have claimed godhood throughout the years. And they have given themselves all sorts of names. Shahin Shah, Malikul Amlak, King, King of Kings. Has any one of them ever dared to give himself the name Allah, Allah, al mahluh al mahbud the one who is singled out in adoration and worship, has anyone come close to that name? And the answer is no. Allah said, Hal ta'lamu lahu samiya. Do you know anyone who has taken this name? One of the two understandings of the ayah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mighty name that has appeared in the Quran around 2,700 times. And many scholars, perhaps the majority, have argued that this is the name Ismullah al-A'zam, the greatest of all names of Allah, with which if he is called upon and a request is made using this name, he will most certainly answer. You know that Allah has a name from his many that he has kept secret to himself, i.e. identifying which one it is for sure. It's fi ilm al ghaib in the knowledge of the unseen. People can make an effort. Which of these names is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The scholars have a difference of opinion. The majority perhaps al-Jumhur have argued that this mighty name is Allah, by which if he is called upon, he will most certainly answer Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he said about his name, فَلَا يُذْكَرُ عَلَىٰ قَلِيلٍ إِلَّا كَثَرَةٍ It is a name with, by which if it is mentioned on something little, it will cause it to increase. وَلَا يُذْكَرُ عَلَىٰ خَيْرٍ إِلَّا بَارَكَ فِيهِ وَأَنْمَاهِ And whenever his name is mentioned upon goodness, baraka will be placed upon it, and it will be fostered and grown. وَلَا يُذْكَرُ عَلَىٰ آفَةٍ إِلَّا أَذْهَبَهَا And whenever this name is mentioned upon an illness, the illness will have to depart. وَلَا يُذْكَرُ عَلَىٰ شَيْطَانٍ إِلَّا رَدَّهُ خَاسِئًا مَدْحُورًا And whenever this name is mentioned upon a shaytan, a devil, he will have to escape in a state of humiliation and disgrace. This is the name, Allah, tabaraka asmu rabbika dil jalali wa ikram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you say, Bismillah. In Abda'u, I begin with the name of Allah. And we're not going to elaborate too much upon this majestic name, Allah. We have mentioned in other classes before that there are several meanings 
which the name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take. How do you translate it? And the scholars have said it can take at least four meanings. A, his name Allah could be from Aliha, making him al Ma'luh, the Ma'bud, the worshipped one. Allah meaning the worshipped one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the eternal refuge, the escape of all of humanity. So when you say, la ilaha illallah, there is no ilah but Allah, you are saying there is no escape for people, for creation, except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the second meaning, the eternal refuge, the escape of humanity, Allah. A third meaning is the element of bedazzlement, at tahayyur that the name Allah is in reference to bedazzling, i.e. he bedazzles those who think about him. Or he is the one who causes those to be, he is the one who bedazzles in misery those who choose their live, to live their lives away from him. Or number four, Allah, he is الَّذِي تَأْلَهُهُ الْقُلُوبِ The one whom hearts adore. This is Allah, and these are four of other meanings that we can say is captured by this majestic and perfect name. So you say Bismillah in the name of Allah. And then you say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, the most compassionate, the most merciful. We're going to skip this for a moment because it's going to appear in an ayah in Surah Al Fatiha anyway. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So let's leave that there for a moment. You say Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And then you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, all praise is to Allah. Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of creation. You say Alhamdu with the prefix of Al, meaning the praise. You don't say Hamdan Lillah in the indefinite form. You say Alhamdu, the praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this al, this prefix of al, alif, lam, or you translate it as the, the purpose of it in the Arabic language is lil istighraq, or l'istighraq jinsi al-mahabid. It's to serve the purpose of encompassing all forms of praise. It's there to serve the purpose of encompassing all forms of praise, Alhamdu, the complete praise, the perfect praise, the whole praise. Lilla belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So hand can be offered to people. As was mentioned by a lot of scholars, hand, praise, can be praised or can be given to people because of their good qualities that they have, as long as you, on condition that you acknowledge, that their good qualities is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not praising them because of something inherent in them. You acknowledge it is from Allah. So hamd can be for a sultan, hamd can be for your teacher, hamd can be for a parent. Here what you are saying is alhamdu, alhamdu, the perfect praise, the ultimate praise, the whole praise belongs to lillah. And here subhanallah there is a beautiful fa'ida benefit which was mentioned by Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah in his tafsir. This benefit is the under idea that the very first to praise himself was Allah. The very first to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even before creation existed, even before nothing and no one was around but Allah, he was still the praised one. And that's why Al-Qurtubi, he says, listen to these words. He said, لَمَّا عَلِمَ اللَّهُ عَجْزَ خَلْقِهِ عَنْ حَمْدِهِ أَثْنَى عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بِنَفْسِهِ لِنَفْسِهِ فِي الْأَزَلِ أَثْنَى عَلَى نَفْسِهِ لِنَفْسِهِ بِنَفْسِهِ فِي الْأَزَلِ He said, when Allah Almighty knew the inability of man to praise him as he deserves to be praised, he praised himself for himself by himself in eternity. Did you get those words? SubhanAllah. He said, when Allah Almighty knew the inability of man to praise him as he deserves to be praised, he praised himself for himself, by himself, fil azal in eternity. Alhamdulillah. And that is why Allah says, for example, 
وهو الذي ينزل الغيث من بعد ما قنطوا وينشر رحمته وهو الولي الحميد he is the one who causes rain to come down to the earth after people had despaired and he spreads out his mercy and he is the protector الولي and he is الحميد worthy of praise Allah is deserving of praise Alhamdulillah Anything you may wish to offer to people with respect to gratitude or praise, realize that they are mere instruments used by Allah Almighty to confer a favor to you. Therefore, the source of all favor and khair and goodness and barakah, blessing is Allah Jalla Jalla, who is the ultimate benefactor. It all comes from Him. That's why you say, Alhamdu, all praise. Lillah goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. He is worthy of praise and He is deserving. He is Hamid, deserving of praise. And that's why I uh, love a, a narration that was mentioned by Ibn Ibad, Ibn Ibad al-Hanbali in his book Shadarat al-Dhahab. Speaking about Harun al-Rashid, one of the Khulafa, the caliphs of the Abbasid era. And he had an advisor, a scholar by the name of Ibn Samak. He was a wa'id, somebody who would remind people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the caliphs of the Muslims, the leaders, the rulers, the sultans, they like to keep the likes of Ibn Samak and others next to them to ensure that they were always grounded and reminded of their religion. So Ibn Samak, he once enters upon the Caliph Harun al-Rashid and he was about to drink some, to drink some water. He said to him, Amir al-Mu'mineen, leader of the believers, just a moment, pause for a second, can I just ask you a question? He said, ask, he said, if this cup of water was prevented from you, if you were deprived from the sip of water that you need at this moment in time, how much would you spend? to access this cup of water. He said, Bimulki, with all of my kingdom, you can't function without water. He said, my entire kingdom. He said to him, so if you were to drink this cup of water and then you struggled to release it, it became blocked into your body. Huh? How much would you spend to release it? He said, Bimulki, all of my kingdom. So Ibn Samak, he said, Inna mulkan la yusawi he said, a kingdom that is not even worth a sip of water should not be competed over. Subhanallah. A kingdom huh, that is not even worth this should not be something that people fight over. It's a lesson. Allahu Akbar. So how... Grateful should we be to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. He is Al Hamid. You say Alhamdulillah. All praises to Allah. Who is this Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? The ayah continues by saying He is Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdulillah. All praises to Allah. Who is He Subhanahu wa Taala? Rabbil Alamin, the Lord of Al Alamin. And the Arabic word here for Lord is Rabb. You say Rabb in your salah. What does the Rabb actually mean that we've translated as Lord? The Arabs, uh, the linguists, they say, Rabbu kulli shay'in sahibuhu wa maliku. The Rabb of something is the owner of that thing and is and its possessor. The Rabb of something, he is the owner of that thing and its possessor. So, Linguistically speaking, I am the Rabb of my Samsung S22. Why? Because I own it. I possess it. I have full control over it. So I am by definition the Rabb of my phone, just as you are. That's the linguistic meaning. The owner of something. The possessor of something. This is one of its meanings. And that's why When the Prophet of Allah, Yusuf alayhi salatu was was in prison and one of his prison mates was released, what did Yusuf say to him? He said to him, make mention of me to your Rabb. Who remembers the ayah? Oh, the Qurni? Inda Rabbik. Make mention of me to your Rabb. Does it mean make mention of me to Allah? Remind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of me lingering in prison? Astaghfirullah, no. Udhkurni inda rabbik, make mention of me to your rabb, meaning your master, your owner. Remind him that I'm still lingering in prison. That is the meaning of rabb, the owner of something, the possessor of something, one who has control over something. 
And similarly, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the year where Abraha came from Yemen with the intention of doing what? Destroying the Kaaba. You know the famous incident, Fi Amil Fil, in the year of the elephant, the year in which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. An event that heralded his birth. Abraha came with the intention of destroying the Kaaba, and as he was making his way into Mecca, he found some camels. They belonged to Abdul Muttalib, and he stole them. So Abdul Muttalib, he went to Abraha to speak with him. And Abdul Muttalib was a Sayyid, a leader amidst the Arabs. So Abraha was impressed by his appearance, and he said, bring him in. What can I do for you? Abdul Muttalib, he said, I want you to give me my camels back. He said to him, I was so impressed when I first saw you, and we meet. And you know I'm about to destroy your Kaaba, and you're asking me about your, your lame camels. What did Abdul Muttalib say? His famous words, who remembers? Huh? Who remembers? Yeah, I hear it. We'll, we'll look after it, exactly. Yeah. He said, Ana Rabbul Ibil, I am the Rabb of the camels. Walilbayti Rabbun Yahmiha. And that's for the Kaaba, it has a Rabb who shall protect it. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He said, I am the Rabb of my camels, meaning I'm the owner of my camels. I am the possessor of my camels. And as for the Kaaba that you're speaking about, that has a Rabb, that has a Lord, that has an owner. Allah, who shall protect it? And did Allah protect it? What did Allah do to the people of the elephant? So you say, Alhamdulillahi, Rabb al alamin the Lord, meaning the owner, the possessor, the controller of the worlds. Rabb has a definition which is mentioned by Al Wasiti. Al Wasiti, he said, Al Rabb, there, there's many definitions you can give. This is one of my preferred ones. He says, Al Rabbu huwa al khaliq ibtida'an. Al Rabb is the one who created in the beginning. Wal murabbi ghidha'an and who nourishes throughout. Wal ghafirun tiha'an and the one who forgives in the end. Subhanallah. He's Al Rabb, he is Al Khaliq ibtida'an, the one who created in the beginning. That's Al Rabb. Wal murabbi ghidha'an and he is the nourisher huh? throughout your life. Wal ghafirun tiha'an and he is the one who forgives in the end. So you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabb. Rabb of what? Owner, possessor, maintainer, nurturer, fosterer of what? Al Alameen. How do we translate the word Al Alameen? Crude translation, give it a Umir. Of the worlds. Of the worlds. Al Alameen is an interesting word. It's one of the unique ones in the Arabic language. Qatada ibn Di'amat al sadusi Qatada. He said that al alam is kullu ma siwa Allah. It is everything with the exception to Allah. Al alam is in reference to everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the Rabb of that. And the evidence for this definition is mentioned in Surah Al Shu'ara, chapter of the poets where Prophet Musa والسلام, is debating with the Pharaoh of Egypt. What is the Lord of the worlds? What is the Lord of Al Alameen? And Musa, he says, He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and everything between them, if you have certainty. So there you have the tafsir given by Prophet Musa والسلام, where the Pharaoh, he says to him, who is the Lord of the Alameen? He said to him, he's the Lord of everything. So Qatada, he said, Al-Alamun, it's in reference, Al-Alam is in reference to everything, with the exception to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the way, just from a linguistic perspective, Alamun, and it's only Al-Alamin because of its positioning in the ayah, but Al-Alamun, right, is a plural, is a jama'ah. Jama'ah of what? Huh? Alam. An alam is also a plural. So al alamin or al alamun in its original form is a plural. A plural of what? Alam, which is also plural. And the reason, and this is one of the few instances in the Arabic language where a word 
does not have a singular form. So when the Arabs, they say, for example, anam, or the word uh, ar or the word jaysh, army, these are plurals, and they don't have singular in the Arabic language. So a'alam can be in reference to several things. Linguistically speaking, it can be in reference to different generations. So this generation of ours here in the 21st century, this is a alam. And then the different categories of communities within this generation, they are their individual alams as well. So the human beings, as a genre, as a species, they are a alam, alam al ins, the alam of human beings. That's a alam. And then the world of jinn, jinn kind, that is alam al jinn, the alam of jinn, and so on and so forth. So each bundle of communities within any one generation that is called alam, alam, alam. And then within that one generation, the different categories of communities within it, they are called alam. And that's why the plural, the singular of the plural is also plural. So you say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is to Allah, Rabb, the Lord of Al Alameen. And we've understood now Al Alameen. Everything in creation, of course, with the exception to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.